here. Thank you so much for making it here this evening as we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together, for this great opportunity to open your word, for it to nourish us and make us better followers, better disciples, as we try to walk closer with you and as we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth. Give us this day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so, it's amazing, but this coming Sunday is already Super Bowl Sunday. And I know that many of you are getting ready for Super Bowl parties. But you know, football is not a uh, game that is mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> The only game that is mentioned in the Bible is baseball. Right from the very right from the very start of the Bible, we have baseball mentioned there. Genesis 1:1. In the big inning. Okay. Genesis 1:1. <laughs> well, anyway, I told you that uh, when it was uh, two weeks ago, I got rear-ended. Uh, that is, my car got rear-ended uh, in the parking lot of Starbucks, and I told you what car I have. The, remember Honda? What, what kind? Honda Accord, right? The Honda Accord, and do you know why I got it? Because again, it's the only car that's mentioned in the Bible. Acts 2.46 the apostles in one accord entered the temple. <laughs> See, we can use the we can use the Bible for all sorts of all sorts of ways in our life. Well, speaking of the apostles entering the temple in one accord, the readings for this coming uh, Sunday, February seventh, they talk about discipleship. Their call of the prophet Isaiah is present in the first reading. You, you know uh, the famous song that we sing in church, the famous hymn that's Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. <clears throat> we always sing that, Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? Well, that's from the prophet Isaiah and his call to follow God. And then the second reading talks about Paul. Paul, the great apostle, and who was called by the Lord. And so let's look at those two readings. We'll look at uh, the two readings, and then we'll look at the gospel as well for this coming week. And so the first reading is from the prophet Isaiah. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne with the train of his garment filling the temple. Seraphim were stationed above. They cried one to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. All the earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of that cry, the frame of the door shook and the house, of the, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, I am doomed, for I am a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, holding an amber that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with it and said, See, now that this has touched your lips, your wickedness is removed, your sin purged. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. 
the word of the Lord. And then Paul's letter to the Corinthians speaks about his own discipleship, his own call. Brothers and sisters, I am reminding you of the gospel I preached to you, which you indeed received and in which you also stand. Through it, you are also being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I handed on to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. After that, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one born abnormally, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me has not been ineffective. Indeed, I have toiled harder than all of them, not I, however, but the grace of God that is with me. Therefore, whether it be I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. The word of the Lord. And the gospel, which we will uh, read about in just a little bit, speaks about the other apostles who were also called by the Lord Jesus. And so what I want to talk about uh, first with all of you this evening is the idea of discipleship. You and I are disciples of the Lord Jesus. The word disciple is from the Latin, discipuli, which means student. And so we are following in the footsteps of our teacher, our rabbi, the Lord Jesus Christ. But to understand discipleship, you have to understand the ancient Jewish way of educating children. We have to look at the culture in which Jesus was born into, for Jesus was Jewish. For the Jews, education was one of their highest values. It was the way that they passed on their faith to the next generation. In particular, their education centered on the study of the Old Testament. In fact, rabbis in Jesus' day would argue about how early a child could begin memorizing the Bible. The Talmud, an ancient Jewish teaching document, states, Under the age of six, we do not receive a child as a pupil. From six upwards, we accept him and stuff him with Torah like an ox. Torah, of course, is the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and Numbers. The first five books, what are called the law. And so, Jesus would have started his education at a school called Beth Sefer, or, or House of the Book a Jewish equivalent of a primary school for those who were 6 to 10 years old. From the ages of 6 to 10, education focused on one thing, memorizing the Torah. And so Jesus knew his scripture very well. For he was a Jewish young man. At the end of Bet Sefer, only the best of the best students would continue their education. So at the end, when you finished primary school, only the best of the best would then go on to memorizing 
in Bet Talmud or House of Learning from the ages of 10 to 14. And here they would focus on memorizing the rest of the Jewish scriptures. In fact, there are still Jewish men and women who do this to this very day. If you were the best of the best at the end of the Bet Talmud, you would present yourself to a rabbi and enter Bet Midrash. The students here would be elite students, similar to Ivy League students today, like those going to Harvard, Stanford, or Yale. The rabbi would ask you questions to see if you were really the best of the best. This was extremely important for the rabbi. Rabbis had a particular way of interpreting and teaching of the scriptures called their yoke. Does that sound familiar? For Jesus says, come to me, all you who find life burdensome, who are weary from this walk and this life, from all that you have to carry. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. You see, the yoke of our rabbi, Jesus is the rabbi, we call him rabbi, he's always called the rabbi. He's addressed that way in the Bible, we, you, you hear that all the time. He's called rabbi, our rabbi, Jesus, his yoke is light. In other words, he's easy on us. We're hard on each other. See, our problem is that a lot of times we like to think that the way God will treat us is the way we treat one another. And God is so much more easier, merciful on us. God's name is mercy. Jesus refers to this and says, my yoke is easy, my burden light. In order to spread this yoke, a rabbi would only want the best disciples. What kind of a rabbi do we have? If the rabbi believed that you had what it takes, he would say the two words in Hebrew every disciple would want to hear. Lek hakeri, which is come follow me. How does Jesus, when he encounters those he's calling to follow him, what does he say to them? Come follow me. You see, he's inviting us, all of us, come follow me. The Bible is full of that. It's not us who go out and choose the rabbi, but it's the rabbi who's after us. This is so very beautiful. So many of us think that maybe through some merit of our own that we have found ourselves here. It's not through any merit of our own. It's not through our worthiness. God has us here because God loves us and God loves you just because. I just uh, heard about two and a half hours of first confessions in the church. This week we have first confessions. And right before the confessions, as I always do, I always go out and I tell, tell the kids who are there for the first confession, I said, do you know that God loves you? That's why I always say to them, do you know that God loves you? And this one girl says, and he always will. <laughs> she says, and he always will. That should be an aha moment for all of us. God loves us and God will always love us. Love us. And God has chosen us. And as the Apostle Paul says today, he's the least of all as one born abnormally. In other words, all of us, as misfit as we may be, have been chosen by God because God loves us the way we are. And God looked at you when he found you. Remember, all are invited. Few are chosen, Jesus says. You are among the chosen ones. God has chosen you. As God chose Isaiah, as God chose Paul, the Bible is full of that. As God chose Mary, did Mary choose God? No. God went after her when she was 12 or 13 years old. 
God went after Joseph and all of the apostles. God went after you because you are in the line of these apostles and the disciples. You are a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And so hear those words, come follow me. Upon hearing these words, the disciple would leave his family and his village and follow the rabbi wherever he went. This is the tradition into which Jesus is calling his followers. Come follow me. And that's why now it makes sense when you hear that because whenever we encounter Jesus calling his apostles or his followers, the Bible says they leave everything and follow him. Because that's what you did when a rabbi would call you. A blessing developed. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. The hope is that the disciple would follow behind the rabbi so closely that the dust from the rabbi's sandals would cover him. How does this system relate to the scriptures that we know? If we stop and imagine that the disciples are normal people, it is pretty odd that they drop their nets and follow Jesus just because he says, come follow me. Have you ever thought of that? How is it that, you know, if these were regular folks and Jesus comes upon them and meets them and says, come follow me. And the Bible says they drop everything. And you think to yourself, why would they do it? They did it because to have a rabbi come to you and say, come follow me, was the one thing you would desire. The one, the one thing you longed for. For a rabbi to come and say those words to you. Lek hakeri, come follow me. Well, you've got that rabbi who has come to you in your life and who has who has said those beautiful words to you, come follow me. Jesus, as the rabbi says those words to you and I, but he is not the typical rabbi. None of the apostles are in Bet Midrash, that is the schools for the elite. They were not the best of the best of the best. This, this should fill us with such hope this evening when we, when we hear this. Jesus doesn't choose the best of the best of the best. He calls them. They follow because a rabbi thinks they are good enough. Do you get it? The rabbi you have in your life, your rabbi thinks you're good enough. This is so beautiful. For those of us who so many times feel like there's nobody that loves us. This is the greatest poverty in our world today, according to Mother Teresa of Calcutta. The poverty of people not feeling loved. Feeling like there's something wrong with them. The poverty of self-esteem. Your rabbi thinks you're good enough. He has chosen you. You did not choose him, but he chose you. And he has appointed you to bear good fruit. To Jesus, you are smart enough, pretty enough. He loves you as you are. You are unconditionally accepted and cherished and treasured from your mother's womb. In fact, even before your mother's womb. Now, how old were these disciples when they were called? Usually we think of them as grown men with beards. Right? You know those pictures with uh, old men? Well, we know that Peter is older because he has a mother-in-law. You know that. Remember what happened? What did Jesus do with Peter's mother-in-law? He cured her, right? Remember that story? So we know that Peter has a mother-in-law. And we know that from Matthew chapter 8. In fact... What happens later on in the, in, the, in the Gospels? Peter betrays Jesus how many times? 
three times. And you know why? Because he cured his mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> it's like these... Uh, it's like these two guys discussing. One of them says to the other, he says, You know, my mother-in-law is an angel. My mother-in-law is an angel. And he says, Oh, you're lucky. Mine is still alive. <laughs> And now since my new haircut, I hope you like my new haircut. <laughs> you can see the redness. <laughs> we also know from the Bible that since Jesus discusses with Peter the temple tax that, and only those 20 and older paid the temple tax so we know that Peter was most likely over this age so he was a 20 something okay and how old were the other disciples well Jesus worked within a particular cultural context and uh, he was in a particular society. They were 14 years old, 14 or 15 years old at the most. You get it? Some rabbis had a lead disciple who was older than the rest, which would make perfect sense. Peter was the lead rabbi and everybody else was under him. So they were 14 or 15 years old. Stop and think about whom Jesus chooses to be his disciples, to be people like him. Perhaps 14 or 15 year old boys on the B team. And then when you feel like you're not good enough, oh, I'm not good enough. Jesus thinks you're good enough. You are here because he has chosen you to be here. Jesus chose a bunch of misfits. And this means that we are all in good company, each and every one of us. The church, they were young men who weren't the best of the best, and yet Jesus still believes in them, and He believes in you. He believes in you. And He is here to be with you, to accompany you, to help you. He believes that they can be like him. He, because what happened when the, when, the, when the disciples followed the rabbi? They would follow so closely that the dust would fall on them. You are following the Lord Jesus and he believes in you and his dust is falling on you. He believes you to be capable of greatness. And greatness for us is Holiness, to be holy. And we're in great company. You know, if you, think, if you think to yourself, oh, I'm full of doubts, I'm not good enough, I experience all sorts of sinfulness in my life, I'm constantly struggling with this or that. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, whom the church will canonize in this coming September, we know from her life that she spent most of her life with incredible personal struggles of faith where she even doubted the existence of God himself. And if Mother Teresa could do that. But every single day in her doubts, she would pray for one hour. She persevered. She didn't give up. She was attached to the rabbi. She knew that he chose her as imperfect as she was. And God has chosen you as imperfect as you are. Didn't you hear that? But it, it takes great 
humility for us to accept what Paul said today as one born abnormally. Didn't you hear him say that in the second reading? As one born abnormally, all of us are born abnormally. You know why we're born abnormally? Because you and I are sinners. All of us. We're all sinners. There's only one perfect man who walked the earth, Jesus Christ. He walked the earth. All the rest of us are all sinners in the line of the Apostle Paul. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace to me has not been ineffective. It's grace that has covered you. It's a gift from God. You are here because God wants you to be here. There are no coincidences in this life, only God incidences. God has you here today, and God has chosen you. He believes in you. He believes in you even when you do not believe in yourself. Isn't that the best? Where God believes in us and God feels we are capable even when we don't believe we are capable. And He believes you to be capable of great things. And great things for us are to be holy, to continue the struggle. We are the church of misfits built upon the Apostle Peter. And Peter, as I just told you, was a betrayer of the Lord Jesus. He betrayed him, and yet the Lord forgave him and chose him to be the first pope, the first leader of the church. Now, there are two betrayers, two apostles who betrayed the Lord Jesus, Peter and Judas. Both of them. What's the difference between both? Well, you have Peter who loved the Lord Jesus. We know that. And then we have Judas who also loved the Lord Jesus so much. Both of them, think about what happened. After Peter betrayed the Lord Jesus, he cried, didn't he? He wept, the Bible says, because he loved the Lord Jesus. He loved his rabbi. We cry too when we betray the Lord Jesus with our sinfulness. What did Judas do? He also cried, didn't he? He wept. But here's the difference. Judas would not accept the forgiveness, the mercy of God. And he went and gave up. Threw in the towel. Hung himself. And Peter picked himself up. And continued the struggle. Accepted the forgiveness of God. And the Lord lifted him up. We are misfits in the same line. We continue to fall all the time. That's life, falling. If you never fall, you can never get up again. So that's why we fall. The struggle is to continually pick ourselves up, that God picks me up. As I continue my struggle, I'm not going to be victorious over my struggles in this life. My victory is in the fact that I do struggle, that I continue, that I persevere, as Mother Teresa did, as Peter did, as Paul did, as all the great saints. We are the church of the saints. And the saints were all great sinners. They we're all great sinners. If you, lead, if you read the lives of the saints... That's why we look to them for the examples of those who made it, who stuck with their rabbi. That's what we have to do. Stick with him, not give up. In other words, never be afraid, for he is with us. And let's read the gospel. This is uh, one of my favorite gospels, if not the one that I always look to for great nourishment from Luke's Gospel. While the crowd was pressing in on Jesus and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two boats there alongside the lake. The fishermen had disembarked and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, 
he asked them to put out a short distance from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. After he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a catch. Simon Peter said in reply, Master, we have worked hard all night and have caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your command, I will lower the nets. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets were tearing. Then they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come to help them. They came and filled both boats so that the boats were in danger of sinking. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at the knees of Jesus and said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For astonishment at the catch of fish they had made seized him and all those with him, and likewise James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners of Simon. James, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. When they brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. Fear seizes us in our life. Fear is debilitating, it's paralyzing in our life. That is why the Bible is full of over and over again the Lord addressing us, saying, Be not afraid. In fact, do you know how many times this phrase appears in the Bible? Be not afraid, do not be afraid. It appears there 365 times. Do you think God is having a message for us? Once for every day of our lives. And some of you will not believe me. And for those of you who do not believe me that it appears there 365 times, I have one message. Google it! <laughs> 365 times. Be not afraid. In other words, do not be afraid to take the leap of faith. Put out into the deep. Peter was afraid to put out into the deep waters to lower his nets. But his, he, it dawned on him. It dawned on him who it was that was telling him to lower the nets. See, Peter is thinking the way we as human beings do. I, I, we've been fishing all night. It won't happen. But then he says those defining words. Nevertheless, at your word, at your command, I will lower the nets. That's what has to happen in our life when we are afraid, when we are paralyzed by seeing what has already happened in our life. Oh, I won't be able to quit smoking because I've tried over and over again. I won't be able to do it. I won't be able to lose weight because I've tried over and over again. I'm afraid to go to counseling for, the, for my past issues. I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid. I won't be able to get through it. Oh, I know people who've tried it, it won't work. Oh, I've gone to confession maybe 30 years ago and I had a horrible experience. I'm afraid to take the leap of faith to go and try it. You know, I'm retired now and I could go to Mass every day if I really wanted to, but hey, you know, I don't know, it's at 8 o'clock in the morning. Take a leap of faith. Get up in the morning. Maybe you're looking for somebody in your life and you've given up on trying to find a suitable partner for yourself in your life. Take the leap of faith. Go online. <laughs> CatholicMatch.com 
put out into the deep, in other words, whatever it is. Maybe gambling has been debilitating you. You're there all the time, spending lots of money. There's Gamblers Anonymous. Maybe you're drinking too much. You need Alcoholics Anonymous. Maybe you are a family member of an alcoholic. There is Al-Anon for those who are victims of alcoholism. Whatever it is that you need to do in your life, maybe you need to start reading the Bible more. Jesus knew his scripture very well in order to combat the devil in our life who's always after us. We are to know scripture. Remember how when Jesus, we are about to enter Lent right now, when we call to mind the 40 days in the desert, that our Lord was tempted there in the desert. How did he answer the devil? By quoting scripture back at him. Turn these stones into bread because Jesus was hungry, the devil says. And the Lord Jesus says to the devil, it is written because he knew what was written. Do you? If you don't take the leap of faith, it only takes a little bit every single day. A little bit of scripture every day. Don't start reading lots and lots. It's like, you know, when people who try to go to the gym and when they go to the gym and they uh, start lifting heavy weights, they won't come back because their body gets all sore. You lift a little bit. Right? Just a little bit. Okay, people say today, you know, um, for protection, that, you know, some people were telling me, Father, you know, you need, don't you want to get a gun for, for protection? And I said, no, I have mine already. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Take the leap of faith, in other words. You know, it doesn't take great courage to take the second leap or the third leap but the first leap of faith takes great courage the first one i know this very well i remember when uh, uh, i was still in poland we had a lake and i was learning how to swim and i didn't really know how to swim and so i was out out in the the shallow waters and there was mud there and i'd be going there in the mud and i take my head up once in a while and say, look, mom, I'm swimming, I'm swimming. And this was in the shallow waters. I wasn't swimming. I was mud crawling <laughs> in the mud. Quit mud crawling, in other words. Some of us are mud crawling mm -hmm, in our life because we're afraid to, make, to take the leap into the deep waters. And Jesus is saying, quit mud crawling, put out into the deep. In other words, lower your nets for a catch. When it dawns on you that your rabbi, the one who is with you always, who's accompanying you in this life, who has chosen you, is telling you, lower your nets, put out into the deep. When it dawns on you, you'll be able to do it. In other words, down with the nets and up come the fish. Up come the fish. So much that what does the Bible say today? When you lower your nets, then the, the, there's so much fish that you will have to call other boats to come and help you because the, the nets will be tearing from the amount of fish that will be there when you take the leap of faith, when you do and you know what it is that you need to do in your own life. Maybe it's something you need to get rid of in your life. Maybe it's your attitude. Maybe it's asking for forgiveness from someone. Whatever it is in your life, you know it. I don't, I don't have to stand here and name all the things that we could possibly think of that we need to do in order to bring change into our life, in order to take that leap into our life. But in other words, God, as much as you may feel in your life that you are defeated, God turns our defeats into victories. God turns every single defeat into a victory when we allow Him to. The they, they feel defeated there. Oh, we've been fishing all night and we've caught nothing. 
God turns our defeats into victories and he will turn your defeat into a victory. Our big problem in this life is that so many times we may feel like we are victims. We got to stop having a victim mentality. A victim, you are not a victim because of your life circumstances or whatever has happened to you. Stop always talking about all the things people have done to you or life has done to you. You are victorious with the Lord Jesus and you will make it. You know, I don't feel like a victim because I, I'm an immigrant to this country and because at, some, at one point I was illegal here in this country. No, I'm proud of my background. I'm proud that my grandparents were illiterate. I'm proud of that. I don't feel put on or that my parents didn't even graduate high school. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. Proud of all that I've had to go through. I'm not a victim and neither are any of you. You are victorious in the Lord Jesus. And that's how we are to live our life. And only when we feel victorious that none of the things that has occurred in our life has victimized us, but has only made us stronger. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger in this life. All that we have been through makes us only stronger in this life. In other words, this life, the Bible says, is, is fire. Jesus says, oh, how I wish the world was already blazing. This life is fire and you are gold. You are gold. What has to happen to gold in order for the gold to be purified? It is put through the fire. Well, I have news for all of you. Welcome to the fire. <laughs> Welcome to the fire. That's why you have been burned so many times in this life in the purification process. That's why you've been sick. Maybe you've experienced the death of a loved one. Maybe you've gone through a nasty divorce. Maybe you've had problems with your children. Whatever it is. Maybe you are depressed, underemployed, whatever issues, it's fire. But we are on the way for the victory, the end of the purification process, for we are gold. The refiner's fire is here in this life. But what we await is the glory of heaven. Pure bliss, pure happiness. That's why we go through the fire and we endure and we don't give up. That's how we live our life. We are disciples of the Lord Jesus. All of this background that I have given you today should give you a radical sense of your own call that you have been given as a disciple of the Lord Jesus. It's easy to shoot holes in our own character and in our own talents and say, uh, I'm not good enough. Jesus believes in you and he in turn is asking you to trust him. Trust Him. It's not about believing. You know, believing, it's like, uh, think of Mother Teresa here. She went through periods in her life where she didn't believe. Is it about belief? If it would be about belief, then the devil would be a wonderful Christian. Because the devil is a great believer. He believes very well. He knows the creed very well. But the devil doesn't trust Mother Teresa trusted. That's why she's a saint. The devil didn't trust. You and I are called to trust God. Trust Him in the good times and in the bad times. That He, will, he has gotten me through before and He will get me through now and He will get me through and with Him I know where I'm going and I will go and I will make it to my final destiny. We are to trust Him. In other words, will we drop our nets? Will you drop your net? Discipleship is a way of life, a total dedication. Think about this. These 12 men were totally dedicated to the Lord Jesus. They became total 
servants of the Lord Jesus. You and I are called to be servants. As a result, 11 of them were willing to give their life in spreading the gospel. 10 of them died as martyrs. Martyrs, meaning they were killed for the Lord Jesus in being his servants. Jesus is totally dedicated to you. Are you totally dedicated to him? If you are, then there's something in our call. If we are totally dedicated to him, we are called to be like him. And Jesus became what for us? The Bible says in Philippians 2. A slave. Jesus Christ. Here I'm going to quote to you. Though this is from Philippians. Okay. The reading from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Not like in the one church where I was at and they, one person was reading and they say, a reading from the letter of Paul to the Filipinos. Okay? It's not Filipinos, it's Philippians. Even though all the Filipinos are wonderfully happy here tonight. Right? Okay? Jesus Christ, even though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped. But rather, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave. A slave. For our sake, Jesus became a slave for you and for me. And we are to imitate him as well. Are we not? We are to imitate, become like our rabbi. Which means he became a slave for you and I. Aren't we supposed to do that for one another? As difficult as it may be. And it is difficult so many times in our life. To in other words become servants for one another. To serve selflessly. Without expecting anything in return. And this goes to the attitude question in my life. What is my attitude in, with the people that I lead my life with. And with this, I would like to share with you a uh, story from uh, Marilyn and Eves, who are here uh, this evening. And uh, Marilyn is a wonderful speaker. And I had the chance to go and see her uh, speak in one of the casinos here in uh, uh, Las Vegas and she brought up this story because they uh, her and her husband they go and uh, serve a meal at Catholic Charities here in uh, Catholic Charities of uh, Southern Nevada serves a meal every day for the homeless here in uh, Las Vegas and they were coming back in the car from uh, serving the meal for the homeless at Catholic Charities. And Marilyn was on her uh, iPhone, okay, talking with her friend. And she says to her friend uh, on, the, on the phone, she says, oh, we're just coming back from feeding the homeless. We're coming back from feeding the homeless, she tells her friend. And at that, her husband yanks the phone from her. He's like, oh, give me the phone. And he kills the phone, okay? Kills the iPhone. And Marilyn's like, well, what? What, what do you want? What happened? Why'd you do that? And he looks at her and says, Marilyn, you feed dogs. You serve the homeless. You feed dogs. You serve the homeless. What is the attitude with us in our life? When your husband comes home from work, you like, sit down, I'm going to feed you. <laughs> I've heard this many times. In Spanish, it sounds even funnier. You know, the husband comes back home and says, Siéntate, viejo, te voy a dar de comer. No? Okay. 
Sit down, I'm going to feed you. Do you feed the people in your life or do you serve them? In other words, what is our attitude? Maybe hard sometimes. You know, maybe the, the people that we are called to serve are not convenient most of the times. And yet we are called to serve everybody as true disciples of the Lord Jesus. Do you find yourself to be very convenient? And yet the Lord serves you. He became your servant, gave his life for you, and is asking the same thing. You know, it's hard sometimes to put up with the people in our life, is it not? But whatever happened to the idea of our faith of giving it up? Haven't you heard that? Okay, and didn't you hear those of you who went to Catholic school, Sister Mary Amnesia, tell you? Okay. <laughs> Offer it up. In other words, why is it so hard for us to offer it up, the hardships that we have to put up with, with the people in our life? Only if we learn that. In other words, you are sent. You have been commissioned. What is the great sending of Jesus' followers, the, the way that the Gospels end? Go out to all the world and preach the good news. And some of us think that, you know, for that, when Jesus said, go out to all the world and preach the good news, what, did, did he give him a book? You know, like some people, you know, they walk around with books, Bibles. Did Jesus give him a book? Here, here's the Bible. Go and preach the good news. No, when Jesus says, go out and preach the good news, what is he saying? Go out and announce me. Go out and announce me. I am the good news. I am the good news. And how do we preach the good news? Well, we get that from one of our other saints in the church, St. Francis of Assisi. And Francis of Assisi said so poignantly, preach the gospel at all times. Only when necessary, use words. Only when necessary. This is a big lesson for many of us. Because some of us, you know, we have family members and friends who, well, let's just say, they may not live up to our expectations of how they should be living their faith, right? They may not uh, be there as we'd like them, you know, maybe they don't want to go to church all the time, maybe they don't want to pray the rosary with us. Maybe they're, the way they're leading their life isn't the way we would like it. And so many times what we want to do is we want to take the Bible and beat them over the head with it. It doesn't work. It only turns people off. If God was after you, as God was after each and every one of the personalities we meet in the Bible. God was after Mary, after Joseph, after the apostles, after Paul. God is after your family members and friends. And if God is after them, God will find them in God's time. Not on your time. On God's terms, not your terms. What you are to do, instead of yakking so much and, you know, uh, saying, hey, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Talk less to them about God and talk to God more about them. Less to them about God and more to God about them. In other words, pray for them more. When I, was, I had somebody come to me uh, in my previous diocese in Santa, when I was in the diocese of Santa Rosa and they come and they would complain and they, at that particular time they complained about a priest. They say, you know, Father... Father so-and-so is so-and-so, is so, and, you know, and he has this and this. And I say, excuse me, one question. How much time do you spend complaining about him? And how much time have you spent praying for him? All the time, uh, this energy that you put into complaining, you know, why don't you put that into praying for him? And it, it, it would also benefit for us to learn that about the people in our life who may not measure up to where we would want them. How much time do you spend complaining about them and complaining to them and going after them 
And how much time do you spend fasting for them? Oh yeah, that's a practice. That's a fasting. Have you heard of that? Fasting, <laughs> praying, almsgiving. All those are wonderful Catholic practices. We are about to enter Lent. What are you going to do during this time? Not just for yourself, but for the people around you. We are sent to announce the gospel with our life, with the way we treat others. And the way God treats us is with great mercy and compassion and understanding. And that's the way we are to treat one another. Mercy, compassion, and understanding. In other words, we serve one another. We don't feed one another. We serve. We are servants of the Lord Jesus who called us. Just as Isaiah, just as Peter, and just as Paul. Just as Paul. What do all of these three have in common? They have been all commissioned as servants of God. Do you feel yourself commissioned? Well, you are. Oh, I'm not good enough. None of us are. Didn't you hear what Paul said? Born abnormally. It's grace. It's a gift. None of us are good enough. But God makes us good enough because of his lo great love for us. As in the wine sign at Cana, a surprising abundance follows the obedient response to the command of Jesus. Now, I want to uh, also tell you, um, I mentioned the um, uh, curing of Peter's mother-in-law. What happened after she was cured? And the feminists don't like this one. Okay, what happened after... Think of it because you know your scripture. She began, the Bible says, she began to wait on them. And people say, oh, this is, you know, against women because she got up and she did this and she became a servant to them. What the Bible is saying that after you have been cured by the Lord Jesus, after he has touched your life, you are moved to serve. In other words, a sure sign of being a disciple of the Lord is that you become a servant. If, that's the manifestation. Not that I you know, start wearing rosaries or, you know, start putting a big cross on my, uh, or start uh, filling my rooms with statues and all this, or going around and saying, uh, telling people, the sure sign of being touched by the Lord Jesus is that you become a servant. That he has cured you. And all of us have things in our life that we need the Lord to cure. When he has come to fill us with his love, that's the beginning of the process of becoming cured by the Lord Jesus. When he cures us, we are moved to servitude. In the presence of the divine manifestation, all three of the personalities we meet today respond. Here I am, Lord. I come to do your will. I come to do your will. What is Peter's reaction when he catches this abundance of fish? His great sense of unworthiness. He falls at the feet of Jesus and says, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I am a sinful man. We have to, it's good for us to know that we are sinful, but at the same time, the Lord calls us with all of our limitations our inabilities all of us are wounded and yet we are called to be wounded healers in the world in each case what follows this sense of unworthiness is a divine assurance and the biggest surprise of all a commission 
The amazed and kneeling Peter hears Jesus address him, saying, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. Have you heard that? Do not be afraid. For his part, Paul found himself drawn into a mission of surprising fruitfulness. When he alludes to this mission as he writes to the Corinthians, he is compelled to say, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me has not been ineffective. Indeed, I have toiled harder than all of them. Not I, however, but the grace of God that is with me. When you allow yourself to be an instrument of God, God will work through you and bring healing not just to you, but to those around you, to your family. When you allow your heart to be melted by the love of God, then you will be an instrument of love to those around you. Clearly in this pattern, there is a message tonight for all of us here. There's a message here for all of us. We who find ourselves blessed with a sense of divine presence. Many times we feel unworthy. You know, you know those feelings. How could, you know, how could I do this? How, how could God, I can't believe that God, the God of the universe, would choose me. We, we all get that sense. Why? There's no good explanation other than just because. God loves you just because. That's how God is. God does not allow us just to stay there. He's saying to us tonight through his healing presence, forget about your unworthiness. Forget about your unworthiness. I have a job for you to do. You are my disciple. Forget about your unworthiness. I have a job for you to do. Get up and do what needs to be done. And I'll see to it that you get the support you need. For I am with you till the end of the ages. Is God a liar? No. The final promise is... And I always like to say, you know, whenever people say, Oh, uh... Uh, the church is without Jesus. Oh, the church is going to end. The church, of course, the, us, the people. I always like to say, well, that, that would make Jesus a liar. He would be a liar because his final promise to us is, and lo, I am with you always till the end of the age. He is with us always until he will bring us home to be with him forever as we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, this evening we thank you for you have called us and we claim you as our Lord, our Redeemer, but most of all tonight as our Rabbi, the one who is with us and as you continue to walk with us, we always want to be covered by your dust in our life. And we may know that you cover us and that you are with us till the end of the world. And as we glorify your name for that great presence that compels us to be better, to do better, to take those leaps into the deep water with great trust, as we glorify you for this always, we say glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, never shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you, and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One minute, and then you can go. Uh, please make sure if you haven't gotten the book Consoling the Heart of Jesus, 
to get it and read it. It's absolutely phenomenal. And I put it here in the top, on the top notes for you to know the, the title of it. Uh, also, there are some people that have approached me that uh, cannot afford the book. So I was thinking if some of you could afford a couple of copies, if you buy two copies on Amazon, for example, bring me one copy and then I will have it so I can give it to the person who needs it, okay, who can't afford it. Not all of us are blessed to be able to buy uh, a copy for ourselves. But if you're blessed and you're able to afford two books, buy me two, or excuse me, buy, me, buy one for yourself and bring me one and that way I'll be able to uh, give it to the people who would like one. Um, and thank you for coming come back next week and bring somebody okay thanks for being